breakfast it was. It's an exciting day for our high school graduates who are uh, have their ceremony today. They get to walk across the stage and get their diplomas, shake hands with the, well, you know, the, the superintendent, I think, isn't it superintendent? I don't know. Somebody. They get to shake hands with somebody, right? <laughs> anyway, the list of our graduates in there, we have one college graduate. She got her associate's degree and she's going to go and pursue her bachelor's degree. So, um, there's some things coming up. Uh, next Sunday is Family Sunday. Again, that's a Sunday where we try to give, one, our volunteers a break, and uh, two, we want to have an opportunity for you to invite people with families to come in and maybe check us out on kind of a lower key uh, Sunday, and uh, we let the kids come up here and do some fun stuff and sing their songs and uh, different things like that. So that is next Sunday, um, Memorial Day weekend, so we look forward to doing that. And then uh, coming up, uh, we have our guys' day out. Uh, we had a stipulation put on it that, that we have to, uh, for, for uh, legal reasons, uh, you have to be 12 years old.
12 years or older and up to, to come out there and shoot. So we, we'd ask that you respect that. And um, if, if you're able to come out, guys, and um, all the information is in there in the bulletins if you want to see that. And then uh, we're, doing, we're putting a float in the parade this year um, with the help of Christy and Jen and Jason and, and myself. And, and uh, we're going we're gonna to be decorating uh, the float. It'll probably be like a one day, like they're working on the plans of it. It'll probably be like a one day, get all the decorations ready. Then we'll put them in a car and drive them in. And then we'll uh, probably have a day, the day of the float. We'll, have, we'll need all hands on deck putting the things up. So, um, because you can't drive... 65 miles an hour down the highway with a step-down trailer with uh, parade decorations. It'll be in the fields, okay? So um, we'll, we'll have two days of that probably where, where they're going to put a plan together and we're going to come out and we're going to work, okay? And then uh, on the day of the parade, we're going to put it all together. And the last thing I got is uh, our, our baby bottle campaign. Uh, if you want to uh, help out Echoes Pregnancy Center, remember it is a direct... Uh, kind of direct competition to Planned Parenthood uh, from a Christian-based perspective, and they help women who have had abortions, they help them with counseling, they help them with after, they help them with birth, they help them with babies. They do all kinds of wonderful, wonderful work. Um, we love what they do there, and so if, if you want to help raise money for them, uh, it's, a, it's a unique way. You can fill it with your spare change or write a check or whatever you want to do. Um, just grab a baby bottle and, and fill it up. Uh, we would love that, and so... Other than that, that's all I have. Is there anything that I did not mention? Okay. Will you pray with me? God, I just come to you to thank you so much for this day. And thank you for the opportunity to be together in your house, Lord. And just to, to honor our graduates and to look forward to, to what, what they do in life. And, and to be there with them, kind of in the background as they go, Lord. And we pray, Father, that as a church we would remember them in our, in our daily, daily lives and that we would pray for them wherever they go. And Lord, help us with that. Lord, we just thank you so much for what you do in our lives and we thank you for this family that we call home here. And Lord, uh, you know, it's, it's where friends become family and we thank you for that. And uh, Lord, it's, it's something we all long for of connection. And so Lord, I pray that you would just be with us now as we continue our worship. And uh, we, we say thank you from the bottom of our heart with all that we are for what you've done in our lives, for coming and living a life and dwelling among us and, and showing us the way to live. And Lord, but you showed us the way to heaven as well through your resurrection. And so Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for your salvation that you offer us. Lord, I pray that you would just help us to, to live in that every day of our lives. It's in Jesus' precious holy name I pray. Amen. <coughs> If you'd like to, go ahead and stand back up, and we're going to continue on in our services.
Your bulletins is our active prayer and praise list, and this morning is going to be a little different. 
because uh, we want to be conscious of our time today uh, with graduates being here in our midst. And so um, I would ask that you would look over those and uh, if you would join me in praying for our congregation and, and our, our family around us. So pray with me. God, I just come to you to thank you for um, life. I thank you, Lord, that you allow us to be together as family and, and to celebrate. But Lord, in the midst of celebration, sometimes our hearts hurt for our loved ones and, and those with health problems and, and concerns, Lord. We have a big list in front of us of, of people that struggle with health and uh, struggle with uh, ailments. And Lord, it's, it's touched my life and it's touched a lot of our lives. And so Lord, I pray that you'd be with those people in our lives that, that we know that are struggling with their health. Lord, those people that are, that are deployed in the military. Lord, those people that are um, set to, to, to go to the military. Lord, for people with um, family problems. Lord, and, and specifically, I know, Lord, just uh, many people struggle with, with family issues. And so, Lord, we just lift them up to you this day. And ask that you would guide them and direct them and show them love and, and allow people to enter into their life that will... Help them to, to get through, Lord, sometimes. And, and you just allow, allow life to happen. And, Lord, sometimes it's best for us to just, just to sit and listen. And so, Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to step forward and be there for people that need us. And, Lord, allow us to, to be your vessel, your, your instrument of, of communication to people in this world. A vessel of love that, that just is there. And, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be for, here for each other. Lord, that, that you would encourage us and lift us up. And Lord, that we know we have a place to, to call on people when we need help. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just be with us in that. As always, we thank you so much for Jesus and the cross and what he's done for us. And we thank you for the relationship that you want with us. And we thank you that, that you did everything to get back to us. That you were willing to go all in, Lord. And I thank you for that. Thank you for loving us to that point. Thank you for loving um, even even people that don't feel loved sometimes, Lord, I, I thank you for loving them too and inviting them to your table. Lord, we love you. Thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' precious holy name that I pray. Amen.
supper together as a church, as a family. We do this together to remember the Lord's death in a way that he commanded us to do so. I want to bring this morning to this one verse of scripture that will focus our hearts upon the grace of God that has come to us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It is found in Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When Jesus died upon the cross, it was a demonstration of his love, but it was also a substitution for sinners. I want us to reflect upon these two things, a demonstration of his love and a substitution for sinners. When we think of, of the cross of Jesus Christ, we ought to think of his love for us. After all, isn't that what Romans 5 eight tells us? But do we need to be careful in the way that we think of his love for us? There are those who think that Jesus simply died, simply as an example for us to follow. In other words, they believe that Jesus came to this earth and demonstrated the extent of his love and that he was willing to die for us. As we live our lives, we have to be willing to die as well. There's a certain extent to which this is true. After all, Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him. We need to lay down our lives at the feet of Jesus and be ready and willing to give our lives for others. But it's very important that we understand exactly how Jesus demonstrated his love. His love wasn't merely demonstrated in dying. His love was demonstrated in dying for us. Which is what verse 8 says, Christ died for us. The idea here is the idea of substitution. Christ died in our place. We deserve death and hell and judgment, 
but Christ was sacrificed upon the cross for us instead. He was our substitute. Jesus didn't die only as an example for us. He died as our substitution. He was our substitution. His death was for our life. But what makes this even more powerful is to realize that Jesus died while we were yet sinners. Romans 5.8 It is not because we were so worthy of being saved. It's not because we deserved rescue. It's when we didn't deserve it that we were rescued. Someone had to die. Someone had to pay the price for sin. And Jesus did that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, <laughs> what a glorious thing to think that someone loved us so. While we were still sinners, He <coughs> gave life for us. So that we might know life eternal with you. There's no other way, Father, except to death of Jesus upon that cross for us to be with you. Father, help us always to remember the true sacrifice that was given and why it was given. He loved us so. You loved us so to send him. Father, as we partake of these emblems, we do so in awe, in wonder, and in love for our Lord and our Savior. Father, bless those who are about to partake. Help us to always focus upon our Lord and our Savior and to remember he lives for us in heaven. Father, in your son's name I pray. Amen. So we find ourselves here, like I said, it's a graduate Sunday here at First Christian Church. And we love our graduates and uh, we're excited about their next steps in life and where they go and we want to follow them. And we we oftentimes, you know, think about different parts. You know, our parents raise us to, to navigate this life sometimes, and sometimes they don't, you know. But other times we we got to figure it out on our on our own. And so everyone is trying to figure out how to make it in the world, right? And and honestly, some people go to considerable lengths to try and succeed, do they not? Think about some of the things that go on in our culture alone and across the world. An athlete might take steroids or performance-enhancing drugs to get ahead, right? Uh, someone might, might try to, to make it big on the stock market, and they'll, they'll connive and scheme and, and try to get in that insider trading stuff just to make a few extra bucks, right? Think about high school or college. Uh, you know, you got final exams, right? I mean, what's, what's the call on that? Maybe you're uh, thinking, well... I didn't really study for my test. I'll just cheat, right? Or, or I'll have somebody else in college. I've seen many movies where they have somebody else take their test and it, and it always gets found out, right? You know, when, when somebody does that, you know, a lot of times when we go out into the real world, we, we try to, to puff up our resume, so to say, and think we're more qualified than we really are, and then you get the job and and, and you're, you're standing there breaking things or, or not doing things right. You've, you've shut the computer down and you've lied on your resume. And you end up getting found out, right? But the question is in the minds and the hearts of most people trying to, to get through life, okay? How do I make it in this world? And I, I, would, I would pose the question is how do people make it in this life without God? You know... None of those things that I was just talking about will ultimately be good in the end, right? A lot of times people get found out about those things. They get a measure of success. They, they cut in line a little bit. They crash through the gate, so to say. I don't know if you've ever been to an amusement park, right? And uh, they don't like line jumpers at amusement parks. Anybody ever been to an amusement park and seen line jumpers? Man, everybody around them's like, you know, because you've been waiting in line for an hour, and that guy comes up and jumps in front of everybody. It doesn't go over very well, right? But he's trying to get ahead of everybody. He's willing to, people are lying to, willing to lie, cheat, and steal to get ahead. But those things don't last, and they, and they run out. They eventually stop at some point. some point, it catches up to you. So then my question would be, how do we make it in this difficult world then? 
Especially for you graduates, you're getting ready to go out and spread your wings and, and, and you're thinking, man, I hope, I hope my mom and dad have prepared me well. I hope, I hope that I know how to get there. I hope that, that I can make it. And as, as your preacher, I would, I would encourage you to lean into God, okay? The Bible is, is God's word to his people, okay? It, it contains truth that is forever relevant. It doesn't quit being relevant. It gives us principles that if applied, it makes a life worth living. And this morning, as we talk about it, there, there are truths that I think that, that we can glean from God's word and that we can apply into our lives and how we live and move and breathe. And not just for our graduates, it's, it's for all of us. I hope that we'll see how God's word can divine our lives and, and guide us. God's word is a guide as we head into the future. And for you graduates, it's that next phase where, where you can lean into God's word and, and make it. It's not always easy. But with God's spirit within you, you can do it. We, he, you know, we're, we're called heirs of the throne of heaven. God is there to lift you up when you don't feel like it. Your parents are there to support you when you feel like you have nobody. Your church is here to pray for you and lift you up and encourage you when you need it. And I want, I want to give you three truths today that, that speak into God's word and, and going forward into the future. So pray with me and we'll dive in. God, I just come to you to thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to teach from your word. Lord, I pray that you'd use me as, a, as an instrument to communicate your word. Lord, move me out of the way. Lord, let, let them hear your voice in our hearts and in our heads this day. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Those three truths are face your fears, forget your failures, and follow your faith. And I've chosen three scriptures today that, that outline those fairly well. And so we're going to dive in, okay? So number one, I want you to face your fears. Can I tell you that we all get afraid from time to time? We do. Anxiety is a part of the experience of, of being a human. This is why Jesus spent time dealing with it in the Sermon on the Mount. This is why the Bible is filled with fear not. This is why the Bible is filled with encouragement at crucial moments in the lives of people that are trying to, to follow God. And we learn about it. We all get scared. We all have that little pitter patter in our heart. And I'm not talking about like walking into a dark room. We get nervous. And can I tell you that, that God is, is perfect in the way that he made us. He knows how he made us. I always think back to, to Adam and Eve and, and what it would have been like for them. And I, and, and I know things were perfect and all, all fear was not there. But that moment that they sinned and separated from God, they were going out into a world, an unknown world. Man, imagine the, the fear and anxiety that went into that. You didn't know what you were going to encounter. You didn't know where you were going to find your food. You didn't know, you know, God says, hey, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to eat. It's like, ooh, how, 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 do, I, how do I farm, God? You know, I don't know if they even knew how to do it, right? So God knows how he made us. But it doesn't matter how old we are, how young we are, or what, what you're going to do in life, your vocation and all. There's always going to be that moment of uncertainty and fear as you look into it. Can I tell you it's not wrong to, to be afraid sometimes? But what is wrong is when we allow that fear to cripple us and crush us and it controls us. And it becomes who we are and, and we hide and, and, and we can't see clearly past the fear that's in front of us. It becomes this perpetual state that traps us. And, we, and it stops us from living life that God has intended for us. So fear is something that we all experience, okay? How do we overcome it? How do we overcome it is the question. 2 Timothy 1.7. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, it's in the last parts of the New Testament. It's uh, right before Titus and Hebrews, James, Revelation. If you go, if you get to Hebrews, it's too far. Um, you might find a little book in there called Philemon. It's like one page. So 
So, 2 Timothy 1.7 says this. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Now, the thing we have to keep in mind here is that when Paul wrote this, Paul was writing to Timothy, a disciple of his. He was a young preacher trying to be all that God intended him to be, but he was young and going into things he didn't quite understand and know. And God has given him the ability to face his fears, and Paul is reminding him of that. God is reminding Timothy to not be afraid to have confidence in the face of fear. To, to, to go out into the world and face it. Make sure you remember what God has given you. And what has God given us as Christians? He's given us His Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's not a spirit to be afraid. It's a spirit that, that is to allow us, to enable us to, to be brave and to love people and to, to, have, to, to, to be able to say no. You see, the mind gives us the ability to control ourselves. We've got to remember that. We can't just go out into the world and be, be wild and crazy and, and think it's, it's, it's good for our, our uh, faith journey with Jesus. He gives us a voice to, to say no to, to the pressures around us. He gives us a heart that loves people, that wants to see people's outcome to, to know Jesus, to change their lives. You see, fears will be with us all of our life. Something that is key, though, is we can't run from them. And unfortunately, we have to face them. Again, I'm not talking about being afraid of the dark or, or being afraid of spiders. Okay, I hate spiders. Okay. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about those moments in life where we have to step out and, and step out of our comfort zone. And, and God is calling us to do something. And for you graduates that are going into the, to the workforce or to, to the military or to post-secondary education, you're, you're, sometimes there's some unknown. What if I don't make it? What if, I, what if my roommates don't like me? What if, what if I, I get injured in basic training? There are these, these spheres that build up. And I tell you what. Here, here's, here's what I've always lived by, is that when I'm afraid of something, I kind of walk slowly, okay? When I was young and afraid of the dark, right, I, I would, I would kind of creep into the room, and I would get to my bed, and I would, like, jump into my bed, okay? But, it was, but I was always moving forward, right? And I think that's what we have to do. I think we have to move forward slowly. And eventually, you know what we'll do? We'll find ourselves like David of, of the Old Testament, Instead of being afraid, what did he do? He ran at his giant, Goliath. He said, you know what? God's on my side. I ain't afraid of you. I ain't afraid of nothing. Because God is with me. Man, I wish I could... I, I'm about halfway there, I think. I might run a little bit and be like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down, okay? So I would say to our graduates, okay? You've made it this far, Right? God has been with you up to this point. And I would encourage you that you're going to do great in the next season of life. Okay? Just keep moving forward. Be willing to stand against what is wrong. Don't go along with the mob or the bullies. Be willing to step out of your comfort zone. Do something new and adventurous. Nothing that's illegal or dangerous to your health or well-being. Okay? But try to find something new. Be willing to disagree with your professors or your bosses or sometimes your, your squad leaders. Okay? When their words contradict the word of God. Be willing to say to society that it is not right and have the courage to stand up to it with class and gentleness. Be willing to make ethical decisions. Be willing to be the one in your class or at work in your relationships that won't, won't cheat, don't lie, don't steal. These are all, these are all valuable things that, that you've learned, hopefully from your parents. And remember that you serve a God who gave you this, His Spirit. 
And it's a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline, not a spirit of fear. I would encourage you to use what God has given you. Next thing is forget your failures. It comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn there, it's back a few pages. If you get to Corinthians, you've gone too far. If you got to Ephesians, you've gone too far. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. We need a better understanding of failure. When we hear the word failure, what do we immediately think of? It's a negative thing, right? Failure is negative. And as, as a people, we hate to fail. I know being in ministry, I've learned to fail. Okay, I've learned to fail well. When I was a student minister, I would, I would do these huge bashes and, and they would fail. Because like one kid would show up and it was like, Oh, I wonder where everybody's at. Probably out at that bonfire that they're doing bad things at, right? But I've learned to fail. But what I haven't learned to do is I haven't learned to dwell in those failures. I have not learned to, to go, oh, poor me. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be there. And, and, I, and I don't want to get to the thinking that, that I failed, so I'm never going to try that again. Or, or I failed at this, and I, I'm never doing that again. Everyone fails, okay? Understand that. Everyone fails at one point in their life. Those who fail fall in the right direction. What do you mean, can't fall in the right direction? We're going to have those moments of failure. Just make sure that, that we're facing the right direction when we fall. Success is not the final thing, okay? You're go, you're, you graduates, you're going to graduate high school today. Great job. You're going to get a diploma that says that you graduated high school, right? Trust me when I say this. There is more to come. There are more and better things than high school. And you're going to fail when you get out there on your own. Some of you might not even know how to work a coin-operated laundry machine. I don't even know if they have those anymore. A lot of you students will probably have like a little beep, you know, an RFID chip, right? Some of you might not even know how to cook. I had kids that I went to college with that stood there. I'd go down and do my laundry, and I had kids just stand there and stare at the machine. <laughs> they didn't know what to do. Can I tell you that there are kids that don't know how to boil an egg? Did you know that? They don't know how to boil an egg. Why? There, there are wild some kids that, that, that don't know where to go in life or what to do. I had a girl I went to high school with. She didn't know how to pump gas in her car. 18 years old, didn't know how to pump gas in her car. I, I asked her, I, 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 the, I pull up to a gas station, well, I pull up to the street, and she's over across the street at the gas station, standing there looking at her car. And I pull in next to her, and I say, her name's Kristen, I say, Kristen, you okay? She goes, I, I don't know how to put gas in my car. I said, well, you've been driving for like three years, right? Yeah, my dad always puts gas in my car. And I was like, okay, so I showed her how to put gas in the car, you know. But we're going to fail, okay? We're going to fail, but we need to fail in the right direction. We need to fall in the right direction. A lot of us know who Thomas Edison is, right? He had several quotes on his light bulb making skills. Listen to these. I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps. I know over 3,000 ways that a light bulb does not work. I never once failed at making a light bulb. I just found out 99 ways not to make one. And of the 200 light bulbs that didn't work, every failure told me something that I was able to incorporate into the next step. And that's what failure is, folks. What can we learn about how we fail? What can we, we, we learn about our next steps and where we go So what does that mean in our lives? In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, it says this. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. 
forgetting what is behind me and pressing forward. Obviously, it looks like Paul had a lot of failures in his life, too. And he made many mistakes in his life, and he, and he learned from them. He learned a he learned hundred ways not to make a light bulb, right? He learned that moving forward is the best course. Paul had many successes, we know. We, we could read about him in Scripture. But he, but he chose not to dwell on either the successes or the failures. But he just wanted to keep doing what God had told him to do. I would tell you that if we sit and we dwell on our failures, we, we'll never get anywhere. We'll never succeed. We'll, never, we'll, never, we'll always be afraid to do the next thing. We'll always be afraid to try something new. If we fail, get up, brush yourselves off, and move forward. There will be other opportunities. Can I tell you that our successes come at a cost too? If we use them to put others down in our lives, to trample on other people's success and make them look like theirs wasn't good enough. Sometimes we get this head that we can't fit through doorways. And sometimes that could be crippling as well. We cannot let our successes or our failures define who we are. Did you see what our definition comes from? <coughs> I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Our definition comes from the Lord. We press on towards and let our successes and our failures be learning experiences and use those moments to glorify God of who God made us to be. Last thing is follow your faith. In your Bibles, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. You see, in running a race, you always want to know where the finish line is. You want to know how far you've got to go. It's, it's knowing that, that, that goal at the end Knowing those grueling miles that we have to put in to get there, it helps make a way. A lot of us know about the Apollo 13 mission, right? We remember that they had some major mechanical issues. And the possibility of them surviving were very slim. They had to conserve energy as much as possible. They could only do a 39-second burn, if you remember and they were, had no instruments to tell them which direction they were to do it in, right? You remember the story. You've seen it on the history channels, or you've read it in history books. So Jim Lovell, what did he do? He found a reference point. He stared at the earth for 39 seconds. He let it be his focal point, his reference point, that he would never lose sight of. They made it home because he kept his eye on the prize. We tend to steer ourselves towards what we focus on. I don't know how many of you have been driving down the road and looked at something too long. Where did your car end up going? That way you're like, ah! Oh, you know, you hit the rumble strips and you kind of freak out a little bit. So what I would ask you, what is our focus or our reference point? Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 tells us, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. And I want you to hold on to that. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. He's our focus, right? What happens to the many people is, is they take their eyes off of Jesus. They begin to look at other things. Think, think of Peter when Jesus called him out of the boat. He got out of the boat. He was walking on water, staring right at Jesus. And, and what does Scripture tell us? He began to look at the wind and the waves. And he began to sing. He took his focus off of Jesus. And oftentimes, graduates, when we get out there, we sometimes lose our reference point, our focus point. We, we think that, that we can always get back in the race. And sometimes you do, and sometimes, unfortunately, you don't. Because those detours can cost us. To finish the race that God has called us to, we need to focus on Jesus. 
And this will be my encouragement to you graduates. Find a church or a campus house near where you're going to college, or if you're going into the workforce, or on your military base if they allow you, where you connect with other people who are running in the same direction as you are. Find others where you are, 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 are looking at Jesus. I promise you, you won't regret it. And the last thing is don't neglect your prayer life or your Bible reading life. Spend time getting to know more about God. Remember I told you to hang on to that since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness? There's been many people before us that have went on. Your parents that love you so much. Your preacher that is so proud of you guys. Your church family that wants to see you succeed. Let the examples of faith guide you. Let the examples of, of how we live life and love each other guide you. And you're going to navigate some unknown on your own. But focus on Jesus. Let that, let that voice of Jesus guide you. Let, your, let your, whoever your parent was be a guide in your life. Don't fall prey to the junk that's out there that, that people think is normal life when you get out on your own. Especially the college scene. It doesn't have to be like that, I promise. The author of Hebrews says, throw off everything that hinders and focus on Jesus. Listen, we all want to make it in this life, okay? We do. And the next, we want to be successful at what we do. Remember, face your fears. Forget your failures. Follow your faith. It's not as simple. You can make a $100,000 scheme working two hours a week at home. It's not that simple. It's a lifelong pursuit. Life is tough sometimes and life is hard, but it is way easier with Jesus at your side. Because God is greater than our fears. God will help us overcome our failures. And God will guide us along the path of life. Just keep Jesus as your focus. Like scripture tells us. And remember, remember folks, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. He gives us a spirit, a power, of love and self-discipline. His spirit. Will you pray with me? God, I just come to you thank you so much for this day. Lord, again, I thank you for our high school graduates that are heading out into the world, for our college graduate that is heading into uh, uh, a bachelor's degree. Lord, sometimes we don't know what those unknowns are. But Lord, we can face them with you by our side, and I pray that we would be like King David. And we would know, because you're for us and not against us, Lord, that we can run with all we are, without fear, without letting our failures hinder us, with our faith being our guide. Well, thank you for loving us and thank you for Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Our music team is going to come up and they're going to uh, play a song of, of closing for us. And uh, I would encourage you um, to pray for our graduates. Pray for them as they go out in the world because some of you have been to college and you know what it's like. Some of you have been in the military and you know what it's like. So I encourage you to pray for those that are heading out and spreading their wings and getting out there and doing those things. But we're going to sing, so I think we're going to stand and yeah. sing. Okay.
forget our failures, and to follow our faith. Lord, in this life, we have so many things that, that distract us from you. Help us to keep our focus wherever we go. Help us to preach the word wherever we go, and to love you and to love others, as your word says. Thank you for loving us and sending your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go and love, love God and love others, church. Have a great week.